and welcome to Out of the Dark Room on Adorama TV. I'm Ruth Medjber and joining me on the show today is photographer and filmmaker Connor Horgan. Adorama TV presents Out of the Dark Room with Ruth Medjber. So Connor, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, You're very welcome. So you have a film out at the moment, isn't that right? Yeah, uh, my first feature documentary, The Queen of Ireland, which yeah. is the story of how one man in a dress is changing the world. For your national treasure is Panty! been in Irish cinemas for the last while and uh, it's out on DVD as well. Fantastic. Now, I haven't seen it yet, but I am absolutely dying to see it because that, that came out or it was filmed over a time that was really amazing in Ireland where we brought in a new equality law. Um, so what was it that drew you to that story? Well, I'd known Rory, who is the man behind the woman. Mm. Panty is the woman and Rory is the, is the performer behind Panty. I'd known Rory for, at this stage I've known him for 20 years because we'd gone back, we did all of the posters for this amazing event that he ran every year called the Alternative Miss Ireland. So for I think 18 years in February we would all get together and we'd do these amazing photographs which would be turned into fantastic posters of, of uh, Panty in various guises. So I think the very first one was wearing an up mayo t-shirt and a pair of hot pants, you know, surrounded by all these flying pink pigs for a reason. I'd, Still don't know why, but <laughs> it all looked good. Uh, so that kind of it came out of photography in a way. And when I approached Rory, I knew that Rory was always going to be very engaged politically, always very active politically, always kind of uh, keen to kind of help out anything to do with social justice. And then Panty was always going to be wildly entertaining. Yeah. And I think because we had a pre-existing relationship, he, he was used to me pointing a camera at him, basically. So it was a natural kind it of thing. It was kind of a natural thing. He, he turned down a lot of people before us, but when we came to meet, he, you know, and because I'd been a, a fashion photographer and I knew about lighting and I knew how to flatter people, I think mm -hmm. he kind of felt, well, at least it'll look good. At least I'll look good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so tell me there, you mentioned that you came from photography. I mean, that was your main background, right? Is that what you trained as originally, a photographer? I did. When I was a kid, you know, when I was 12 or 13, I really wanted to be a film director. I didn't really know what that meant, but it just, you know, I loved the way that films affected me, you know, and I thought I'd love to be able to do that. I had no idea where to start, and I kind of thought about maybe starting off as a clapper loader and working my way up through yeah. through the ranks, but various other things kind of happened. I, I ended up in London, basically after running away from home, and buying a Pentax NE Super, yeah. I think it was called off some guy in a cafe somewhere and became totally obsessed with photography, like almost immediately. And, you know, I was working at the time I'd, for an, in a really badly paid job and my one piece of disposable income a week would go to getting the one roll wow. done in the local pharmacy, you know. And if I got kind of two frames out of the 36 that were good, it was a good week kind of thing. So were you just kind of teaching yourself as you went along or did you have a mentor? Or did I, you I taught myself. I never went to college or art no. college or, or anything like that. But I, I did know of this guy called Tony Higgins, who was kind of like Ireland's Richard Avedon. He was the first independent uh, fashion and advertising photographer. He started in the 60s. He'd been a carpenter and then he'd, again, he'd kind of fallen into photography and became, right. again, totally obsessed with it. And I'd known him because he had used me and my sister as child models when we were kind of little <laughs> mop tops, little blonde mop tops, you know, age six and seven. Okay. And I went back knocking on the door and, you know, he didn't have a job and I just kind of kept knocking and, and, you know, I started being his second assistant and I'd borrow photography books off him so I'd have a reason to go back and give them back and kind of go, hi, it's me again. And eventually his assistant left and, and I was the guy who knew all the light bulbs were kept so he took me on. And, I did two years working for him, which was just the most amazing education because as well as learning so much about lighting and about photography and how to deal with people, he taught me how to run a small business, mm. which was invaluable. Yeah. Know. So when you came into your own as a photographer, I mean, you've worked for some really big clients, right? I mean, British Vogue and all sorts of... I kind of, yeah, I did a lot of kind of commission portraits for a lot of the big magazines. If they had something that they needed doing here, they'd often get in touch with me. And um, I, yeah, I did a lot of, of those kind of things. And it was great. You know, yeah. you'd often kind of spend, you know, a day or two traipsing across the country and bringing assistants and lights and backdrops and stylists and makeup and hair. And, you know, you'd be the circus coming to town. And that was always 
kind of a, a really fun thing to do. You can make the space your own when you arrive in, in some way and then get the best out of the people. Tell me a little bit more about those high production type shoots. I mean, even in terms of where the initial idea comes from, would you sit down with uh, you know the magazine and say, this is what I want to shoot? Or did they come to you with an idea? How does that the work? The editorial thing was often left really up to me, wow. which was kind of great, you know, because you know editorial doesn't pay as well as advertising. Mm. It, you know, there seems to be a sliding scale. In advertising, the, the, you never have the idea. You're basically executing somebody else's idea. Yeah. It's also the, the part of photography that pays the best. So in some ways, you're kind of bringing your skills, bringing your technique, bringing all your experience to bringing somebody else's idea to life. I mean, the thing is, I always felt, even though I was a fashion photographer, I was an advertising photographer, I did, you know, for years, I'd go over to Miami and shoot kind of catalogues and mm. shoot kind of lingerie catalogues every December, and I'd be borne across the Atlantic on waves of jealousy from all my male <laughs> friends. You know. Absolutely. You know? and, but I always kind of felt that my thing was really portraits. Really? You know? It was just people, and be it kind of people on the street or kind of friends of mine or whatever, it was, you know, if it was a, if it was, was a successful fashion photograph, it was a it was a good portrait first and foremost, yeah. and the clothes were kind of always secondary in some ways. So portraits really are your thing. I can tell that from your work. It seems you get you get a look out of people that I don't think you could get. Or other photographers, I definitely couldn't get. So I mean, even I'm thinking about photographing um, the president of Ireland, like Mary Robinson. Yeah. You've got her giggling in a picture. <laughs> How does, how does that work? You know, it's something that's, you know, you, it's just be like a really professional portrait and there she is laughing away. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I do. I mean, I kind of, you know, I mean, I remember there was a fashion program on Irish TV for years called, I think it was Head to Toe or something like this. And they kept asking me, can we come and film you doing a shoot? Mm. And I just always said no, because... In a way, I didn't want to see what I was like when I was taking pictures yeah. because I'm, you know, I'm very much in the moment. But okay. something as I've grown older and as I've kind of gotten better at what I do, mm. and I think just as I've grown a bit as a person, mm. there's some kind of intimacy that happens between me and the other person. And I know that I'm playing a large part in that. I don't exactly know how it's happening. But there's some engagement, there's some level of communication that then comes across in the picture. And I find that absolutely joyful I mean there's something and I know that the people when they see the pictures are, are often kind of very taken with that as well because I'm there's a communication going on you, you know, get something good. out of them that yeah, they probably you know. aren't willing to give but when they do they're quite happy about it P possibly I know I know that one of the things that I do when I'm photographing people is that I almost invariably make some kind of a fool of myself very early on because you know in some ways, because it happens. You know, like if intentionally? I don't, well, if I, if I don't do it intentionally, it'll probably happen unintentionally. <laughs> and the thing is, I'm basically letting everybody in the room, everybody on the set know it's okay to get it wrong. Just kind of just it's to a, it, you know, it doesn't ma It's not about we have to get something right here. Yeah. You know, it's what kind of whatever happens, happens. Maybe I'll ways, try yeah. that. Actually, I don't think I've, I think I just do that naturally. I just well, always mess up. <laughs> well, exactly. And people kind of, oh, God, thank God. Yeah, <laughs> you know? it's like we can break now. Yeah, it's not so yeah. high, strong, and tense. Yeah. Maybe, that is how, that's, maybe that's why you're, the documentary side of things is good as well, because you really get to know people and, and kind of, they're at ease with you, so they'll be more comfortable in the camera. I'd ho I hope so. I mean, it's certainly, you know, we, we spent five years chasing Panty and Rory around with five, with years. five years. You know, and some of the time at the beginning when there was no money because for most of those five years there was no yeah. no funding whatsoever you know at the beginning there was me on camera and you know an intern waving a microphone vaguely yeah. in the same direction as where the camera was pointing and you know we were lucky to kind of get anything but we did and then as things came along we started getting production funding there were more and more camera crews and stuff like that but I think you know there is a quality to being a very attentive um, present photographer mm. without imposing yourself on the situation yeah. which I think really helps in that kind of situation in, in a documentary kind of situation where people know that you're there but you're not they don't know what you're trying to get okay you, you know so they're just happy to do whatever it is that they're they want to do and you're not saying here do that again or you know you're just you're just watching you're you're, 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 you're you know you're watching you're there you're very much paying attention to, to what's happening yeah. and you're kind of you're it's almost like a dance in some ways. Like you're kind of dancing with them, you know what I mean? They go there, you go there. Yeah. And they can feel that and they know that, you know, whatever they do, you'll, you'll match it, you know? So that, I think that, that gives them a confidence as well and it just, 
it makes for good material. Maybe I need to come and film your work so that <laughs> I can see this magical <laughs> dance in play and, and try and mimic it myself, <laughs> see how I go. Um, another thing, just we mentioned dance, I think my favourite piece that you've of yours um, it's not actually one of your photographs, which it should be, because I'm mad about photography, but it's um, it's a, a film that you did, a short piece that you did with um, the Deep End Dance, yeah. which is the mother and the son, the choreographer's mm -hmm. son, um, underwater. This looks like a logistical nightmare in terms of shooting it. The, well, there actually is a making of video on okay. Vimeo as well, and it's funny, like, the making of video is about twice as long as the actual video. It would have to be. I watched <laughs> that video. And there's all kinds of stuff, with, you know, yeah. cutting out like lead in lead sheet in the weight in the same kind of in the template of his shoes and there's putting that in, in his there's shoes. weights in his shoes. He's wearing a diver's belt at one point. But, you know, he's dancing at different levels of the water. At some point he's kind of walking on the floor of, yeah. of the, the swimming pool. At other points he's up near the surface. So he's differently weighted and differently buoyant for all of those different levels. I just and thought it, it was magic. Uh, well, it is magic, <laughs> and that's the great thing. But this is the magic of film because we've had some really clever people who, really, if they sat down and thought about it, would not be asking us this question. Say, how did he hold his breath for six minutes? Aww. Because it just feels that, that it's, it's a continuous seamless. movement, and the cutting is kind of yeah. invisible, and they don't know that in but every twenty seconds, uh, David is coming up to the surface and go. <gasps> <Wow. laughs> And then going back down and picking up the action. Exactly I kind of, I did off, feel you know? that. I felt kind of stressed towards the end of it. I was like, he needs to breathe. <laughs> he needs to breathe. Let him go. Um, it was, it was fantastic. I mean, uh, from a, even from you know a camera point of view, how 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 does that work? Well, where were you? Well, I, I started off up or above with a, a remote feed from one of the cameras. We in the pool. We had a safety diver. We had two underwater cameramen and first the AD and the, the safety driver and the two underwater guys were both wearing suits and, and uh. masks and everything. And I was up, up looking at this on the monitor and it just wasn't working for me. So I put on the suit as well and the aqualung and went down and I was directing by, you know, kind of saying like, widen out, move in, move in. Like, of course, because you can't hear. Because you can't do anything. So I was hovering over Richie McKendrick who had, had the main camera looking down and he had a little kind of uh, monitor in the top of the camera so I could see what he was shooting and I was able to communicate with him and then I would go up, direct David, and David would come up for air and then go back down again. Wow. But I needed to be in the space and, 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 and that is his 68 year old mother in the pool with him and they are in the pool where she was a swimming instructor for many years and indeed where she taught him to swim when he was two years old, it's the same pool. Oh my God. There's so much involved in six minutes. It's incredible. I love that piece. I absolutely love it. But I've been taking pictures when I got the little Fuji, the X-T1 first, and I got a converter for my old Nikon lenses because mm. I haven't been able to let them go even though I haven't really shot film in years. Um, and I just started taking all these pictures of people I met and my friends. I'd go for coffee and I'd take pictures of people. And there was some quality to these pictures that I was really enjoying and other people seemed to be really enjoying. And I'd post them online just for kind of fun. And, and my friend saw them and just liked them. And it kind of helped inspire an idea in her to get me to do 50 portraits of 50 of her closest, her nearest and dearest people to mark her 50th birthday which was just a wonderful idea. Beautiful. And, and then as the thing progressed, of course, she said, well, of course, we have to put that so-and-so in and so-and-so in. And so -and -so. It ended up being 122 people. No. And I travelled all over the... You met 122 well, of her friends yeah, and photographed them. Yeah, and wow. interviewed them all as well. I interviewed them all and, and kind of taped it all on my, on my phone. And then the interviews became the captions for the photographs as oh. well. Yeah, so. And then created the book alongside yeah. your sister. Yeah, so it's a big, thick book. Yeah. The, Straight off, you see the portraits. They're very... Beautiful and rich colours and tones. There's also, if I'm right, some lights thrown in here. Occasionally, but you know, I kind of, you know, where, whereas I used to, as I said, arrive with kind of, you know, the entire circus. I have a little kind of hand basher, and I've got, I got one of these, like it's about a meter and a half wide. This huge umbrella okay. with a, a white softener in the front, and yeah. it's silver inside, and it's kind of like, I mean, it's this size. Yeah. You know, It'll go up pretty of, quick, I'm sure. It goes up really quick, yeah. and the light is just gorgeous off it. It is just yeah. the most painterly kind of light you could yeah. possibly imagine. And to be able to, you know, kind of carry that onto a plane, yeah. 
Yes. Is just remarkable. Which is know, the thing. So. I mean, when you're dealing with portraits, you kind of have to be quick so that you don't yeah, lose people's exactly. attention. Yeah, Because totally, you want to yeah. talk to them. You don't yeah. want to be fiddling around with lights. And yeah. then you, if you're going to visit 122 people, you need something that packs mm. up quite neat. Mm. They're gorgeous, gorgeous portraits. But this isn't their first book, sure it's not. You had no, a book. I, I did a book on, I went to, I spent a winter in New York and I got a little, that was when I first kind of got, came across the Fuji cameras and I got a little Fuji X10. Put together this kind of book, it was about an A4 size book and yeah. the pictures just printed up beautifully. They're gorgeous. You know, just, oh, thank you so much. Yeah. And again, you know, I put it up on Blurb, I can self-publish it. We sold like 150, 200, you know, loads of prints. So people are still buying prints from my kind of New York adventures. Uh, it is, it's totally your New York adventures. It's you, yeah. it's, we're, we're walking through the streets of New York as you. It's your yeah. point of view. And I love that. I mean, we and go from, it's not just like, street photographer's book. There's everything in there. Yeah, I mean, there's you're portraits and all kinds of stuff. Form and shape and yeah. everything about it. It's, it's, I think it's, it's like a little narrative of New York. It's, it's almost a portrait of New York. Thank you so much for coming and chatting to me today. I could you're talk to you for hours and hours and hours, but we have to end at some point, Connor. Thank you. I look Thank forward to much. seeing more of your work. Thank Cheers. You very much. Well, that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you want to start the conversation then please feel free to leave me a comment below. I really do appreciate your feedback. If you'd like to brush up on your own photography skills then check out the Adorama Learning Centre. And as always, if you want to see more videos then subscribe to the Adorama YouTube channel. Thanks and I'll see you again soon. Do you want great looking prints at low cost? Be sure to visit our easy to use online printing service. Adorama Pix has professionals who treat your images with the utmost care that you can count on. For a quick turnaround on photos, cards, or albums, use adoramapix.com.